This is my Bible. Your word written to me. All that says I have, I have. And all it says I can do, I will do. I believe now, right now, in the name of Jesus, I will receive revelation knowledge of your holy, written, living, uncompromised word. As this knowledge is revealed to me, I shall be made free, absolutely free in every area of my life that others may see Jesus in me. I believe it now, right now. I'll never, 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 ever, 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 ever be the same again in Jesus' name. And Father God, as your word goes forth today, I thank you that you are watching over that word to perform it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. May you rise up big within me because I have submitted myself to you, spirit, soul, and body, so the people can learn of you and be taught of you. So the eyes of their understanding is being enlightened. They may know what is the hope of their calling that's in Christ Jesus. I declare the kingdom of God is at hand. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. Nobody leaves the same way they came. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Destined for the miraculous. This is number two. Destined for the miraculous. Take your finger and point it at you and say, I am, I am destined, destined for the miraculous. That's my destiny. In Jesus' name. Mark chapter 16 verses 15 through 20, foundational scripture. He said unto them, this is Jesus, by the way, okay, so pay all attention. The head of the church says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. He that believes and keeps on believing is baptized, shall be saved, but he that believes and keeps on believing is not, shall be damned or be judged. But these signs will follow them that what? In my name. Do you believe in the name of Jesus? All right. Then you should be casting out devils, speaking with new tongues. Amen. Snakes can't hurt you. You drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. You lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. And then after that, the Lord had spoken unto them. He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Wow. Mm. I just want to go down an alley here a minute, just a minute. He sat at the right hand of God. See, God turned the kingdom over to Jesus. Then God sat down. Now Jesus went to heaven, defeated death, hell, and the grave. And then he turned it over to the believers and he sat down. That's why we're supposed to do the work. Jesus is sitting down saying, take care of it. Amen. Verse 20, they went forth, preached everywhere. The Lord working with, and King James of them is in italics, italics, confirming the word with signs following. So the Lord worked with them. The Lord worked with the word that was in them. Yes. And he confirmed the word that was in him. If there's no word in you, the Lord hasn't got anything to confirm. Amen. If you didn't eat breakfast, your body cannot partake of the breakfast. Amen. 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 You see, that's what happens to us a lot of times. You know, we, eat, we sometimes eat three meals a day, but... We don't eat any of God's word. Amen. And we expect to be spiritual whizzes, but when a problem comes up, all you got is Cheerios. <laughs> I just had a picture that I just, just, you know, praise the Lord. Oh, I'll cast that thing out. Cheerio, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> no word, no signs. But it's directly related to how much you believe it. See, you, you can read the word all day long, but if you don't start believing what's in there, it's not in there. It's just in here. 
and faith is of the heart. So miracles, for our understanding, it's when, when heaven touches earth. When the natural order of things are changed supernaturally. And if it's in the realm of possibility, we don't need miracles. Amen. Amen. But when you can't overcome in the natural, you need a miracle. But as long as it's possible to fix in the natural, you don't need your miracle. But I say to you today, you are destined for miracles. But the miraculous won't happen if all you do is worship and never witness. And the miracles will never happen if all you do is witness and never worship. We need heaven to touch earth, but we need to touch heaven. God lives and moves in what we would identify or conceive as being miraculous, but in reality, that's just him being him. I mean, what's a God, what's a miracle to God? Nothing. Just, that's just the way it is. God's stuff. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God, what? All what? All so with God, what? All now, nobody that has any lick of sense at all would disagree with that statement. I mean, if, if there is a God, and there is, and, and you know, then I'm sure he could do stuff. <laughs> God can turn the impossible into possible. Because that's who he is. See, when in an impossible situation, if God shows up, the situation is going to have to change. <clears throat> Amen. It's like, it, it's interesting. Situations change by the presence. And you know that's true. When I was in law enforcement, I'd walk into a particular place and everybody's attitude would change. <laughs> not, not really. When I find out I'm a preacher, everybody's attitude changes. Just, your presence causes change to come. Yeah, Amen. Absolutely. Hallelujah. So, we don't have any problem believing God can do stuff. But then in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said something pretty amazing. Of course, everything he said was amazing. But look at this. Jesus said unto him, if you can believe. Does that say all things? I wonder if that's the same all things that we read in Matthew. Gee, all things are possible with God. But look at what Jesus said. All things are possible to who? Yeah. Him that does something, believes. believes and keeps on believing. So not only are all things possible with God, all things are also possible with you. God can turn the impossible into possible, but you can turn the impossible into possible also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So all things are possible to you if you can believe it. Now, we, we left off talking about signs, wonders, and miracles. And signs have a purpose. I don't know if you knew this or not. They do. They have a purpose. But signs, now stick with me, they're not an end to themselves. Signs point to a greater reality. Signs point to a greater reality. For example... Uh, we have exit signs in here. And when you leave the building, you don't go out through the sign. <laughs> the sign is pointing the way to the exit. When, when, you, when you need to put out a fire, you don't take the sign that says fire hose this way and beat out the fire. The sign is pointing you to the reality of the fire hose to put out the fire. 
the sign is not an end to itself. It's actually pointing to a greater reality. Signs on a road. Let us know we're on the right road. Or signs on a road, let us know we're on the wrong road. But signs will do that. <laughs> but without those signs, we don't have any way of knowing if you're in the right place and headed in the right direction. Amen. Signs are not the ultimate goal. Amen. One more time, you're going to have to get this down. Signs are not the ultimate goal. Signs point to the ultimate goal, which is a relationship with God. Amen. For instance, if, if, if you're driving to a city, let, let's say Los Angeles, you get to the outskirts of the city and you see a sign that says, welcome to Los Angeles. So what do you do? Well, you just stop there and camp at the sign for a week <laughs> and then go back home Amen. and someone says, how was Los Angeles? Well, wasn't much going on. <laughs> you never experienced the city. You just hung out with the sign rather than the reality that the sign was pointing to. You don't tell stories about the sign, how big and bright and beautiful it was. That sign is to point you to a greater reality rather than just the sign itself. The sign is not invite, in, inviting you to experience the sign, but experience the city. But if you don't go past the sign and get to the city, you miss the point of the sign. Amen. <laughs> so most of you know this is a, is a landmark in, in Hollywood. Up on the hills, they got this Hollywood sign. So you go to the Hollywood sign, you hang out there, and someone asks you, how was Hollywood? <laughs> you don't know how Hollywood was because you never experienced Hollywood. You only experienced the sign. Amen. Are you getting this? Signs and wonders do not exist for themselves they exist to point us to the greater reality, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Miraculous healing is a sign, but it points us to the healer, Jesus. Yeah. Miraculous deliverance points us to the deliverer, which is Jesus. Amen. Miraculous provision is the sign which points us to the provider, which is Jesus. All signs and wonders point to a higher reality and have a meaning behind them. Every time God reveals his presence in miraculous ways, like, a, like, like the cloud in the mountain in Exodus, the message was an invitation into a relationship. That's why we don't follow signs. Signs follow us. We just read that in Mark 16, didn't we? All right. Here are some references to miracles in the Word. Uh, miracles were provision. God, God provided manna and water to the, to the children of Israel as they traveled to the promised land. Jesus turning the water into wine at the wedding. Miracles of protection, Daniel in the lion's den. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Meshach, Yershach, and a bungalow. That's the way I remembered that. <laughs> In the fiery furnace. Increase. Jesus fed the 5,000 with some sardines and some crackers. Resurrection. When God brought people back to life. Victory. Walls of Jericho coming down. Miracles over nature. God sent a star to guide the wise men and in a storm Jesus gets up and says Shh. and it did Amen. how about transportation you know we have a lot of 
I don't know, they used to not, I remember when I was a youngster, when they were bringing out the new cars, it was like November, they'd bring out the new cars and they'd, they'd put a covering over it. You couldn't see it. They put a sign there, this is the new such and such year and they put this thing over it. You couldn't see it until a particular day, I think maybe December 1st is when they pulled back the covers of the brand new car. Now, I mean, they're coming out and with the next year's cars now. And they have been for quite a while, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but Jesus walked on the water. Well, Peter did too. And Elijah, he got a pretty good limo ride. Chariot of fire. Miracles of communication when God made a donkey speak. I like that story because that means there's hope for all of us. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> or the Holy Spirit using the gift of prophecy or ministry in the speaking in tongues. Usually miracles are, are, are God responding to a problem somebody has. Problems are just another opportunity for the Creator to get creative. There are no problems too big for God because nothing is impossible for God. Impossible situations are the time we need to tap into God's power. A miracle is simply an encounter with the creative will of God. Here's the problem, God shows up, problem changes. Miracles are only difficult, pay attention, when we think we have to have the ability. Amen. See, the reason we don't move, do more is because we have too much of us on our mind. That's why Jesus, remember what Jesus said? He said, why are you looking at me as if I'm a big deal? He said, it's the Father within me. He does the work. When you get that revelation, it's the Father within you. He does the work. You're not going to back down from any devil that comes after you. We're the vessels that God is wanting to pour his power through. And miracles are going to happen. And they're going to follow you when you start to believe that they are possible. Because with God, all things are possible. Watch, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Therefore, all things are possible with you who believes. But if you don't believe it, you ain't gonna get her. Amen. Believe it, you get it, you don't, you won't. Amen. But see, we spend so much time in the negative, we spend so much time in the I can't world or I won't world, it's tough to get into the I believe world. Well, that was good preaching. Oh, it's great preaching. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's a Latin term, phrase, called ex nihilo, which means literally out of nothing. Okay? Ex nihilo. Are you impressed? Yeah. Don't look at me. I got a program that pronounces this stuff for me. <laughs> So anyway, and it means out of nothing, okay? Now, some folks have figured and looked at scientific achievements and said, wow, look at what they did. They even cloned a sheep. You remember her? What was her name? Exactly. No, her name was not exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There, there was a scientist, though, that, that was really smart. And so he, um, he went to God and he said, science can do everything you can do, including making life. I challenge you to a man-making contest. God said, okay, you go first. So the science reached down, he picked up a handful of dirt, and God said, no, 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 I made that. 
first you have to make your own dirt. You see, man, what man calls creating is, is taking something and making it into something else. But God creates out of what we'd refer to as nothing, ex nihilo. Everything that is once was not. Everything that is at one time wasn't. But it did exist in the mind of God, and God spoke, and it came into creation. God can create something out of nothing in your life. He can create something out of nothing in your family. He can create something out of nothing in your finances. He can create something out of nothing in your business. He can create something out of nothing in every area or aspect that is involved in you. God can turn your nothing into something. I got good news. Listen to this. You, want, you can believe this. You were a nothing, and God made you something. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. See, I just done preached. I got my own amen corner up here now. Glory to God. I realize that there's a lot of people in church today that don't believe in miracles. Well, (laughs) there's... you know, narrowing it down, I believe there's probably two main reasons why they don't. Number one, an, adequate, an, an inadequate view of God and an inadequate view of the Word. Amen. <laughs> there's a group of religious leaders who came to Jesus, and they were called Sadducees, and they were. They were sad, you see. <laughs> And the Sadducees were an interesting group. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in anything like that. So they tried to trip Jesus with a trick. We refer to it as a trick question. I have been accused of that. Yes, I've been accused. But in Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Two things. You don't know what the book says, and you don't know the power of God. People today don't know what the book says and don't know the power of God. Misunderstanding the Bible leads people into error. (laughs) And we got a lot of help misunderstanding the Bible out there. If you've never been around or experienced the power of God, you may doubt its existence. I know sometimes people have come to here in, 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 in the ministry where they come, maybe they sit in the back row or whatever. Nothing against people sitting in the back row. This person just happened to sit in the back row. And I laid hands on somebody. And they hit the ground. And I didn't knock them out either. I mean, I didn't go boom. You know, I just... Bing. And that person accused me of being a magician. Why? Because that's all they knew. That's all they understood. They had never been around anything like that. And I'm sorry to say that most of the church fits that category. I like what Brother Hagin said one time. He said, people wouldn't know the Holy Ghost if he came into church wearing a big yellow hat and sat down in the front row. You have to think about that for a while. It's it's not enough to know God's principles, but we also got to know His power. You've got the same Holy Ghost in me that I got you you know in you that I got in me. Guess what? You got this. I'll I'll kick you up a notch. You got the same Holy Ghost in you that Jesus had. And what Jesus do? 
He went about doing good, healing all the oppress of the devil, for God was with him. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed you with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. Why? Because God was with you and in you. It's not enough to know his principles. It's not enough to know his power. We've got to know both. There's a group of people religious people that are called cessationists. That's a big word in itself. And the root word for cessationist is cease. What does cease mean? Stop. Stop in the name of dumb. <laughs> oh, no. So, you didn't know I could do rock and roll, did you? <laughs> Oh, somebody stop me. <laughs> okay. Cessationists are people who believe miracles have stopped. Well, why did they do that? Well, they kind of differ in their viewpoints, but some of them think that miracles stopped the day the last of the original disciples died. <laughs> some of them think that miracles stopped the day the last person whom the disciples laid hand on died. Can you imagine for a minute? It just, now, you're going to have trouble fitting this because you don't fit this group. But if this group, here's their logic. Here's, here's John, the beloved, very aged now. And he's praying for people. And they come up and he's praying and praying and praying. He says, whoa, can't do this anymore because I'm going to die. And so here's this long line of people that never get to him. That doesn't sound like God would do something like that. It's just my own personal thought process. So, so some of the people even believe, and this is most of them. Here's the way most of them think. We have this, therefore we don't need those signs and wonders and miracles. I didn't say I believe that. I'm just saying that's what they said. And I'm telling you right now, a bunch of them do that. So we're going to start looking at this part of the series anyway, at several reasons why miracles still happen today. Number one, this book never says Miracles will cease on earth. Miracles happen in the Old Testament. Miracles happen in the New Testament. Miracles happened all the way from yeah, through the Bible, all the way from Genesis, guess what, to the signs and wonders of the book of Revelation. Some of the events in Revelation haven't happened yet, and, and they include miracles, signs, and wonders. So, there are miracles in the past, present, and future. But some theologians want us to believe they've stopped for now in this present time. Well, I got news for you, Mr. Theologian. There is no Bible reason to believe miracles stopped happening. Aha, but we have Scripture. Yes, you have a scripture that you take out of comment. Okay, we'll look at it. The cessationists have a scripture justifying their thought process. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to read 8 through, 8 through 12. Charity, that's agape love, never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Why? For we know in part, we prophesy in part. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Cessationists say that the perfect that was to come is the Bible. It is perfect. But you see, since we have the Bible now, cessationists, all 
miracles and supernatural gifting ceased because we just read that, right? Well, no, we meant. There's nothing the record that indicates that, that perfection mentioned is the Bible. In fact, let's jump down to verse 12. Gee, verse 12 says, For now, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I, are you getting this? But then shall I know even as also I am known. The perfect that we talked about in verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, then all this stuff will be done away with. <laughs> Who's coming? Jesus is coming. <sighs> verse 12 is talking about when Jesus comes, because now we're in a place where we don't understand everything, but we're going to see face to face. We just know some stuff now, but then when, when Jesus, when the perfect Jesus has come, you getting this? Perfection comes when we see God face to face. Full knowledge comes in the hereafter. In this lifetime, we just see dimly. In this lifetime, we see part, but in heaven, we will see clearly. Obviously, there's not going to be need for miracles in heaven. I don't think we need to prophesy or speak in tongues or other, I don't know what language, heavenly language is going to speak, but I mean in, in reference to our manifestation on earth of the speaking in tongues, there's no need for that. But we're not there yet. There is absolutely no, and please, 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 if you can correct, you can correct me on this, you find me in this book where it says that it, it, any of this stuff has been done away with in the book. And I will get up here and change it. There's no biblical justification for believing that miracles have stopped happening. Let's look at another reason to believe that miracles still happen. They still happen because people have needs. <laughs> That's pretty profound, isn't it? You see, a people has all their needs met, you know, fine. They don't need a miracle. Unless they get a real bad report from a doctor. The doctor says, I can't help you. Now they need a miracle. As long as we're here on earth, people, we're going to have people get sick and need healing. As long as we're here on earth, people are going to be bound up and need deliverance. Miracles are needed in earth. We're not going to need them in heaven. Now, some of these needs of people are not going to be able to be met by any human being. But look what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 27. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So you may not be able to get it fixed with man, but God can fix it. Amen. Hallelujah. If you have a miracle, God's still in the miracle business, and he's going to use you to manifest it. Another reason miracles still happen, why? Because of the character of God. Yes. Miracles show the love of God and, and, and the goodness of Him. Many times when Jesus performed miracles, the Word says, He was moved with compassion. Let me just give you some Bible help here. Compassion is not a feeling. Compassion is actually a person. God is love. Amen. What's compassion? I heard it explained this way, and I like this definition. You do this what you want to call Well, you will anyway, but anyway. It's putting yourself inside someone else's body and looking through their eyes, thinking with their thoughts, walking with their feet, touching with their hands. That's compassion. Compassion is a person. Matthew 14, 14. Jesus went forth, saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Now, just a quick question. Do you think Jesus is still moved with the compassion? Yes. Is God still a good God? Yes. Well, see, hello. <laughs> In this, this story, Matthew 14, you, you might want to read it. And this is, this is when uh, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, 
got all over uh, Herod for his lifestyle. And uh, his wife uh, tempted him, of course, and daughter danced for Herod and said, I'll give you anything, anything, what do you want, what do you want? And give me John's head on a platter. That was Jesus' cousin. Now think about this for a while. This was not in the first day of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry was quite large at this time. He had an immense following as far as numbers goes. And I'd present to you that I believe that there would have been enough people to storm that castle and take the place over and take Herod out. But Jesus did something. He didn't attack the leaf on the tree. He went to the source of the problem. The devil caused all that to take place. And so Jesus slapped the devil. How did he do that? He healed all the sick that were there. Amen. Amen. Another reason miracles still happen is to bring God glory. Whenever Jesus did miracles, people glorified God. Matthew chapter 15, verse 30, great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered, sounds like a wonder, doesn't it? When they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Miracles glorify God, not man. I know there's been times when God has uh, touched people mightily in this ministry, and I'm telling you right now, I was just the tool. It wasn't me. It's was the one within me that got it done. Amen. Amen. And uh, you always give God glory. Always. Always. In John chapter 11, Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus glorified God when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Yes. And after that, the word says that Lazarus, now this is really cool. I never really observed this until recently. The word says that Lazarus appeared at some meetings with Jesus. It's interesting, I think. There's no recorded words of Lazarus. Why? Well, how about this? Because all he had to do was show up. That was the dead guy. He didn't have to say much. <laughs> Amen. All he had to do was show up and people glorified God because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Which gets rid of our long prayer thought processes. You know, if I just pray longer and harder, well, three words got Lazarus raised from the dead. So I just, you know. Amen. Miracles still happen to prove that God's gospel is true. But it's true whether there are miracles or not. But God uses miracles to authenticate who Jesus is in John chapter 5, verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Amen. John 14, 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the very work's sake. Jesus is pointing out that miracles are a reason to believe in him. I call it, you know, signs and wonders and miracles. I call it God's dinner bell. Amen. Remember, you look at the sign, but that's not what the sign is for. You go to what the sign is pointing to, which is Jesus. Another reason, they open the door to evangelism. Miracles draw a crowd. But I have found, especially in these latter years of ministry, the people don't talk about it to their friends and other people. They kind of keep it within themselves. 
Very rarely do they say, boy, you know what happened to church today? Wow, man, got a person out of a wheelchair or, or, or uh, somebody's broken arm is healed or something like that. You don't hear people talking about that. You know why? Because they've got the spirit of fear in them because they're going to be confronted by the enemy and they're nervous about what they're going to be able to do. And the spirit of fear comes on them. But God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. When somebody gets born again, which is just absolutely the greatest miracle, how many times have we told somebody, wow, so-and-so gave his heart to the Lord today and got, became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. God set somebody free today. Man, you should have been there. It's wonderful. Why don't you come on down? You got a problem? God will fix it. Come on. See, we don't do that much anymore. I'm not sure why other than fear. Huge crowds came to see Jesus do miracles, and when they did, he preached to them. This happened to others, too. You know, when Peter, he raised a woman from the dead. In Acts chapter 9, verse 42, it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Miracles are one of God's tools to get people's attention and show them that they need him. I've seen God work miracles, praise God, hallelujah, and I've had... People come and uh, sometimes for the wrong reasons. But it's just God doing, being God. Yes. Amen. Yes. You know, someone came up to this preacher one time and said, Well, I've been all the, the big healing ministers. Let's see what you can do. <laughs> Nothing. Might as well just go sit down because you're looking at me. And you just got me in a bad attitude, so I ain't going to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Except I have to repent. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So God gets people's attention. And sometimes, you know, we miss the, the miraculous because we're looking for, I mean, we, we, we look for the miraculous and we miss it because we're looking for the spectacular. Amen. One word from God can change your life forever. Amen. You could be sitting here this morning in this congregation and me just going on and on, whatever, and just something in there is going, Bang, the Holy Ghost just gives it to you and you're set free or you gain some knowledge or something. That's miraculous in scope. It's hard to get that in physics class. It's really tough to get it in geometry. But miracles are just one of God's tools to get people's attention. God said, these signs will follow the believers. Yes. If you're a believer, you've got signs following you to the degree that you believe it. Amen. Amen. I mean, think about how amazingly weird this is. Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. There is no natural reason on this planet why that should work. But the reason isn't from this planet. That's why it works. Amen. <laughs> when a believer lays hands on somebody and believes in the name of Jesus, it's as though Jesus himself were standing there doing it. And see, that's, that's difficult for us to comprehend sometimes, but that's exactly what takes place. That's why the Apostle Paul, listen to what he said. He said, hey, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not me that lives, it's Christ that lives within me. Amen. So when the Apostle Paul laid hands on someone, it wasn't Paul doing it, it wasn't Saul doing it, it was Jesus doing it. Amen. Amen. We are the body of we. Hello, we are the body of Christ. Where are the hands? In the body. We are the body. You lay hands, the body of Christ lays hands on someone. It's though Jesus did it. That's why if you believe that's true, you can receive it. But if you don't, if you just believe it because it's going to give you a goose bump, you may have problems. But if you believe when hands are laid on you, you're going to receive because it's like Jesus himself was there doing it, you're going to get what you came for. 
Amen. But if you believe it's just, well, I'm a Pastor Dave lay on me. Well, praise God for that. You know, and I appreciate your confidence, but it's still Jesus in me. He does it. I haven't healed a fly or a gnat. G N A T, come on. It's the one within me. He does the work. And here's another thing for you. As we listen to the Holy Spirit and He tells us to do something, we need to instantly obey Him and do what He tells us to do. Amen. Did you know we had a miracle? We had, well, actually, it's been more than one, but we did. Can anybody explain to me? Did we have a miracle happen in our service today? 